In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good evening and welcome again to our Wednesday evening Lenten lecture series here at St. George Greek Orthodox Church in St. Paul, Minnesota. This year's, we've been doing this for about 16 years, this year's theme on Wednesdays is Modern Heresies. And uh, we've covered uh, topics like secularism. What were some of the others? If you can remind me real quick. Humanism, Humanism and rationalism. rationalism. That was last week. Thank you. So tonight we're going to talk about pluralism, which is a little bit different, but somewhat related to what we've been talking about before. But before we talk about pluralism tonight, we're going to review real quickly what we talked about last week with rationalism. Rationalism is the view that regards reason as the chief source and test of knowledge. And this came to the fore in the age of reason, or the Enlightenment, which was in the 18th century, an intellectual movement which dominated the world of ideas starting in Europe. And uh, it saw reason as the primary source of authority and legitimacy. This, however, was preceded by scholasticism, which began in about the 12th century and extended up until the 18th century or so. Uh, and it was a method of critical thought which dominated the teaching by academics in medieval universities in Europe, employing the method in articulating and defending dogma in an increasingly pluralistic context, which we'll talk about uh, tonight, pluralism. It was a, an outgrowth and a departure from the Christian monastic schools of the earliest European universities. And when we look at scholasticism and then the age of reason or re rationalism, enlightenment versus orthodoxy, we, we talk about the difference between reason and theoria in the Orthodox tradition. Eastern theologians assert that Christianity is the truth, that Christianity is in essence the one true way to know the true God who is, in, who is the origin and originator of all things, seen and unseen, known and unknown. Christianity is the apodictic truth in contrast to the dialectic, rationalized knowledge which is the which is the arrived at truth by the way of philosophical speculation. Theoria is obtained according to Eastern Orthodox theology by the way of contemplative prayer called isikia or hesychasm and is the vision of God as the uncreated light, the light which was seen by the apostles or the disciples on Mount Tabor when Christ himself was transfigured before, the, before them. St. Gregory Palamas, whom we commemorated in the Orthodox uh, lectionary, uh, liturgical year just two weeks ago, uh, was himself, uh, he explicitly stated that he himself had seen the uncreated light of Tabor and had the vision of God, and he called it Theoria. Theosis, which is a, uh, a common term in Orthodox tradition, is also the English form of it is sometimes referred to as deification or becoming godlike. But theosis or deification was obtained through the practice of hesychasm, isikia, and theoria is one of its last stages. So catharsis is the beginning stage, of which would be cleansing or purification. Theoria would be the second one, which would is also sometimes re referred to as photesis or illumination. And then the final process is the completion of deification, also called theosis. We also talked about last week about in the rational kind of realm about the, the logismi, the thoughts, and how they play a role in our spiritual life. So let us go to pluralism tonight. Pluralism, of course, comes from the root word plural, which means consisting, containing, or pertaining to more than one. In philosophy, pluralism is a theory where there is more than one basic substance or principle. 
as opposed to dualism or monism. Dualism meaning two, monism meaning one, pluralism meaning really even more than two. There are things like we hear about today, such as cultural pluralism, a condition in which minority groups participate fully in the dominant society, yet maintain their cultural differences. That's also known as multiculturalism, a preservation of different cultures or cultural identities within a unified society or state uh, or nation. Now, what we're really focusing on is religious pluralism. And it is an attitude or policy regarding the diversity of religious belief systems coexisting in society, which is indicated by one or more of the following. Uh, as the name of the worldview according to which one's religion is not the sole and exclusive source of truth, and thus the acknowledgement that at least some truths and true values exist in other religions. Number two, uh, as acceptance of the concept that two or more religions with mutually exclusive truth claims are equally valid. This may be considered a form of either toleration or moral relativism. Number three, an understanding that the exclusive claims of different religions turn out upon closer examination to be variations of universal truths that have been taught since time immemorial. Number four, Sometimes as a synonym for ecumenism, religious pluralism, well, ecumenism is the promotion of some level of unity, cooperation, and improved understanding between different religions or different denominations within a single religion. So, so in other words, religious pluralism is equated to ecumenism. Religious pluralism has been defined as respecting the otherness of others. Freedom of religion encompasses all religions acting within the law in a particular region. Exclusivist religions teach that theirs is the only way to salvation and to religious truth. And some of them would even argue that it is necessary to suppress the falsehoods taught by other religions. Now, related to religious pluralism is the existence of relativism, the belief that all religions are equal in their value and that none of the religions give access to absolute truth, and thus this would be an extreme form of inclusivism. Likewise, syncretism is the attempt to take over creeds of practices from other religions or even to blend practices or creeds from different religions into one new faith as an extreme form of interreligious dialogue. Syncretism is not to be confused with ecumenism. Now, when, in my research, I found two very good articles. One is by Father George Papadimitriou, who uh, was, when I was at the seminary, was the director of the library at Holy Cross in Boston. Uh, his son was one of my schoolmates, and uh, he wrote a very good article about uh, that was titled An Orthodox Christian View of Non-Christian Religions. And I'm just going to share a few excerpts of, from that, and then we'll go on to the other article, which was by Father Thomas Hopko. In today's pluralistic society, it involves numerous and ongoing contacts among people of different faiths. Sig and because of that, significant difficulties arise that each religion holds to its own truth claim. A major challenge for Orthodox Christians is to articulate theologically correct approaches to people of other religions. Here, Father Papa Dimitrios' thesis holds firmly to the centrality of Christ, a doctrine which is not negotiable, yet acknowledges that salvation can be found outside of Christianity. So, a couple basic truths which are important to remember as we talk about religious pluralism 
is in the truth in Orthodox Christianity that God's essence is incomprehensible and inaccessible to the human person. It is beyond all creaturely approach. Creaturely approach. So that relates to what we were talking about last week about rationalism, is that you cannot know God through your, through your intellectual exercise of your mind. You can only know God because he reveals himself to you in a direct and personal way. That's a basic truth of Christianity. Otherwise, he's unknowable. The second basic truth is that uh, all persons are created in the image and likeness of God, whether they are baptized Orthodox Christians or regular Christians or not Christians. They're, no matter who they are, they're all created in the image and likeness of God. And as we know, the great commandment that Christ reaffirmed uh, in his journeys and teachings was that uh, is to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So there's a, in, in Orthodox Christianity, in the Orthodox, the, there's a vertical relationship that occurs between mankind and God, and there's a horizontal relationship between persons of humanity. And this reciprocal love is, uh, is a reflection, if you will, of the, the love that is shared between the persons of the Holy Trinity. Now, Orthodoxy has, well, I should say, there's, there's three views of, of non-Christian religions. First of all, the first view is the exclusivist views, which says that non-Christians will be damned because there is no salvation outside the visible body of Christ, the church. The second view is called the inclusivist view, which is that the non-Christian may be saved in spite of their religion uh, of their, that they practice, but they will be saved only by the mercy of God. And thirdly, which is the cultural pluralistic view, is that the non-Christian may be saved by means of the very religion that he or she practices, for non-Christian religions may also contain saving truths. Now, the first one, the exclusivist view, is rejected by Orthodox Christians. We do not believe that if you're not Orthodox or you're not baptized that you are not going to be saved. Okay? With regards to cultural pluralism or religious pluralism, we uh, we have to be. We, this is relates to what we just talked about a little while ago. We have to be very careful about that because of what we talked about in terms of relativism. In other words, that there's all you know, everything's true for you kind of thing, or syncretism, which is just kind of a blending of everything together, and you make kind of make it up, make up religions based on. Uh, uh, your uh, buffet-style approach to religion. So, so in other words, we, we as Orthodox Christians do not see Christianity as simply one of, uh, you know, one of many religions that are all equally valid. So, so, in essence, what orthodoxy really embraces is the middle way, the inclusivist way, which says that people can, can be saved despite their other religious practices, which may not be Christian. Now, Jesus said, what do, what do we find in the scriptures? Well, first of all, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay? So, so Christ is the way to the Father. There's really no other path. In Acts chapter 4, verses 12, the, the, the apostles uh, were preaching that there is salvation in no one else. In other words, there is nobody other than Christ. For there is no other name under heaven given among men which, by which we must be saved. 
John 3.16, very famous verse, which most of us know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So in other words, we don't say, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave Buddha, or he gave uh, Muhammad, or, you know, somebody else. He gave his only son, Jesus Christ, so that whoever believes in him would be saved. And in Colossians 1, 19 through 20, for in him, all in him, meaning Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell therein, and through him, Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. But having said this, the Holy Spirit is not confined to the canonical boundaries of the church. We know uh, in John 3, 8, that Jesus said the Spirit blows where it wills. Uh, so it can, the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, can work outside the confines of the church. In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, it says, Truly I perceive God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. St. Paul addressing the Christians, and or, well, not just the Christians, but many people in Athens, observed that, the, that the, even the pagans who worship the unknown God, whose name and message he came to proclaim. So in other words, the ancient Greeks and Romans, the God that they worship, the unknown God, St. Paul was saying, I know his name and his name is Christ. With regards to dialogue with non-Christian religions, we're going even back to St. Justin Martyr, who is a second century uh, apologist, said this, he says, whatever things are rightly said among all men are the property of us Christians. He stated that Christ is the firstborn of God, and we have declared above all that he is the word of whom every race of men were partakers, and those who lived according to reason are Christian. In other words, you could say that all people who live according to God's purposes are God's people, even though they may not, may not know it yet, so to speak. Because, he says, the seed of reason, the logos, is implanted in every race of people, and therefore makes God's revelation accessible to all. St. John Chrysostom in the 4th century tells us that God is not particular, but he is the father of all, and his providence brings the nations to salvation. To the Jews, God gave the written law, but to the nations, he gave the natural law, the law innate in human conscience and reason. Professor John Karamiris who was taught at the University of Athens, stated that in God's mercy and justice, he will judge people worthy even though they are outside the true church. And I would argue that we who are inside the true church will be held to a higher standard than those who are outside the church. So we may, we may have less of a chance of being saved by virtue of our being part of the true church because we have a higher standard to live up to. So, uh, if, we, if we believe that the Orthodox Christian faith, church, its teachings and traditions, is the true faith, then we will be held to a higher standard by God than those who are members of other faiths which we see as, let's say, not containing the fullness of truth. So, so in other words, we have, more, we have a higher standard that we must live up to, which could possibly make it more difficult for us to be saved than for somebody outside the church. Does that make sense? Well, let me let's finish, and then we'll come back to it, okay? All right.
Uh, another preeminent scholar, Leonidas Philippides, stated that the seeds of salvation are available to all people and that no people are deprived of God's providence. And, I, and his work in, in compared to religion and Christian theology points out that, the com, that common ground exists in all religions while simultaneously emphasizing that the Christian faith has the fullness of truth. So, remember what Pontius Pilate said? The question that he asked Christ? What, did he, what was the question? He says, uh, yeah, are you a king? He also asked Jesus a philosophical question. He said, what is truth? How did Jesus answer Pilate? Pardon me? He didn't, that's correct. He did not answer Pilate. He didn't give him an answer. And Christians interpret this silence as Jesus' reply that the truth was standing before him. Because Jesus said, I am the way, I am the life, I am the truth. So it's not, what is truth? That's, it's just not the right question. The right question is, who is truth? And that is in the person of Christ. So for Orthodox Christians, we, we have to be careful that we don't think of truth as purely a philosophical principle. Truth is a person. Who the person is the incarnate God, Jesus Christ. Now, even though we claim the truth, orthodox as, as in order to claim the truth in Christ, orthodoxy there is a fusion between the truth claim and the mandate for tolerance. We may say that one cannot be a Christian without embracing tolerance as a concomitant of Christian love. So this is, I think, where it's really difficult in American society today because if you say something like, Jesus is the only way to the Father, people think you're being intolerant. But that's not, you know, this is not the orthodox approach. We believe that you could be both and at the same time. It's not either or. So you can, you can make a claim to truth in the person of Christ, but at the same time be tolerant of other, other people's belief that, that uh, belief in other something else. Does that make sense? So I think this is really one of the unique things that orthodoxy has to offer the world today is that we can, we can make truth claims in Christ, but we can also be tolerant of other people's beliefs, which may not, we may, may not share. We Orthodox Christians live in societies around the world that are culturally, linguistically, and religiously plural. And this has cultivated and nourished a deeply felt attitude of respect, tolerance, and understanding toward other people and their religions. Archbishop Anastasios Yanalatus, who is the uh, uh, Archbishop of Albania, who led basically a resurrection of the Orthodox Church in Albania from virtually nothing after communism to a resurgence of a very live and vibrant church now. Uh, he says, being created in the image of God, every human being is our brother and sister. that and project that without getting 
emotionally, spiritually beat up? Good question. Well, I think we're going to answer that question in just a moment. Uh, the last thing that I'll say about uh, Father Papatimi True's article uh, is that it is a strongly held Orthodox view that our commitment to Christian truth affirms a pluralistic, democratic setting where all people can live in peace and harmony, holding fast to the truth of Christianity. Orthodoxy defends the right of all religious expressions to coexist harmoniously in a setting of freedom where equal protection is afforded to all under the law. So, what does that mean? It means that uh, even though we make truth claims to belief in the person of Jesus Christ, we are tolerant and loving to people who don't share that belief. That's the opposite of the Taliban. The Taliban basically said, if you don't believe, you are going to be uh, persecuted, punished, or even killed. Okay. That's, that's uh, the peak of intolerance, let's say. All right, so let's move on to Father Thomas Hopko's uh, article titled Orthodoxy in Postmodern Pluralistic Societies. As you may remember, Father Thomas is uh, a priest of the OCA, Orthodox Church of America, an eminent uh, theologian, scholar, and pastoral theologian, a pastoral uh, minister, uh, one of my favorite authors and writers and speakers. So, we think, we sometimes think that today our situation is unique in America, living in a pluralistic society where we have so many cultures, so many religions, but the reality is, is it's always been that way. Think about the early Christians who lived in the Roman society where there was a, where paganism, the belief in many different gods existed. And orthodoxy has always been a minority within a minority. Misunderstood, feared, ridiculed, rejected, and persecuted. It was this way in the earliest church. Or Orthodox were a small group within the so-called Jesus movement, the way, as we hear it's called in, in the early scriptures. But this, this Jesus movement, the way, was surrounded by Gnostics, legalists, and fundamentalists of various sorts as witnessed already in the canonical New Testament scriptures. So Paul, St. Paul, one of the main things he's talking about is how to deal with the Judaizers, right? Uh, the, the Gnosticism was just starting to come into fore at the end of the New Testamental period, which Gnostics claimed that you uh, that the only way you could not know God was was a special. There was like special knowledge, if you will, that was only granted to a few, not not in other words, not open to everybody. But this was also true. This religious pluralism was also true in the Constantinian age when Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire because uh, Orthodox fathers and saints were martyred or heavily persecuted because heretics, apostates, and evildoers in the Christian church, in the Christian empire, persecuted them. And of course, this is true through the Ottoman times of persecution and in Russia under communism, and it is true today. So, so, so let's dispense with, you know, we live in an age now that is different than any other age, okay? So, Father George Florosky is another 20th century uh, theologian from the Russian diaspora, but who, all, who taught uh, in, here in the United States at this, uh, different seminaries. He critiqued the heterodox suetomorphoses of orthodoxy. 
In modern secularized society, the language, structures, symbols, and rites of classical Bibli biblical Christianity remain, while their content and meaning are radically altered. And in this postmodern deconstruction of the modern worldview, by way of radical personal and cultural existentialism, by way of the sexual revolution, by way of the mystical quest, by the way of the politicization of theology and ethics, by the way of the explosion of material and spiritual hedonism and avarice. In other words, all of those things take the traditional language, structure, symbols, and rites and try and recreate them to the point where their original content and meaning no longer remains, but are replaced by a whole new reconstruction of reality. So thus, in post, remember when we, we talked to the first session, we talked about epistemology, ways of knowing. How do we know what we know? We talked about pre-modernism, which is revealed truth. We talked about modernism, which is empirical truth. We talk, and then we talked about post-modernism, which is basically self-created or self-constructed truth. So in the post-modern pluralistic world, there is no truth no right, no good, no beauty, which all human beings are created to discover, know, and believe, to which they are all called to conform in thought, word, or deed, in which they are privileged to delight and rejoice, and for which they are blessed to give glory and thanksgiving to God. So in other words, there's no, you, that you can't, in the postmodern world, you can't claim exclusive claims to truth. It's just seen as inappropriate or unacceptable. And likewise, there is no meaning and there is no purpose for all people. Everybody has their own purpose, has their own meaning, and has their own truth, whatever they construct for themselves. So there is a, a creation, there's uh, instead now, there's a creation of reality or what you could say is many creations of a plethora of pseudo realities produced by the subjective willings or wishes of individuals, parties, or interest groups in the context of politics, power, self-creation, and permissiveness. The tenets of modern liberal democracy now become objects of worship and ends in themselves in a politicized, hedonized world. Freedom becomes license. Acquisition becomes a right. Differences are deified. And happiness, now understood as material and pseudo-spiritual pleasure, becomes obligatory for all. <coughs> Back in 1937, Richard Neighbor who was a, a Protestant theologian, said that modern American liberal Protestantism would have a God without wrath that brings man without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. I'll say that again. A God without wrath brings man without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. That's what, that's kind of summing up postmodern pluralistic society. It can now be said that in a new age of postmodern pluralism, divinity without sovereignty brings humans without dignity into an age without responsibility through the exploitation of a god or goddess of your choice without tragedy. So, how, uh, how do us Orthodox Christians, how do we respond to this? Well, Father Hopko says there's four possible responses to postmodern pluralism that are unacceptable. He says, first of all, we, it's unacceptable for us to deny that postmodern pluralism exists and is rapidly growing. Postmodern 
Pluralism is here. And it's here, going to be here for a long time. The second thing that's unacceptable is for us to think that our churches are immune to postmodernism and untouched by its influence and power. We Orthodox Christians are infected and, uh, as anyone else. We are, we are just as easily diseased and deluded as anybody else. The third unacceptable response is imagining that we can reject the contemporary world by taking refuge into a world of our own making. When Christ said, you know, told the disciples, he says, you, you know, you were in the world, but don't be of the world. He didn't say, get out of the world. He didn't say, get, escape the world. He said, you're going to be in the world, but don't be of the world. And finally, what is unacceptable, we must not fall prey to the postmodern pluralistic worldview as some great new opportunity for humankind, which Orthodox Christians should welcome as being inherently consistent with traditional Orthodox views of freedom, personal dignity, cultural diversity, incarnational theology, and apophatic mystical theology. So, in other words, we can't, can't somehow take in the ideals and values of pluralism into our own practice of our faith. Ortho now, there's, I think this is what we, is going to answer uh, Mark's question. Orthodox Christians must, must once and for all abandon the lie that we and our churches can live by Christ's gospel and still retain all the riches and glories of our peculiar national cultures and identities, even using orthodoxy itself for this purpose, a deception which we Orthodox in modern and postmodern pluralistic societies have largely accepted and enacted. Our present pathetic realities reveal the results of such false belief and behavior. We Orthodox in North America and Western Europe are, are far along the way to losing both our faith and our culture by fusing them together as if they are one and the same. This is, well, this will be, this is already leading into next week's uh, topic on philatism. According to Christ's gospel, there is only one way to save our lives and everything in our lives worth saving. That doesn't mean that everything in our life is worth saving, but everything that is worth saving in our lives. There is only one way to save it, and that is to deny, forsake, and even to hate all things in this world for the sake of Christ, the gospel, and the kingdom of God. It is to hate our families, our nations, our possessions and cultures, and even our earthly ecclesiastical institutions for the sake of truth. As St. Paul said, to count everything as a loss for the sake of Christ, and to suffer the loss of all things and to count them as dumb. For the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus and being found in him, as Hopko says, these are violent words, and they are true. We violate them at our risk. The good things in life, not our weaknesses and faults, are our greatest temptations, in which it is they which become our idols and cause us to distort reality, deny truth, and endorse deception. So, coming to the end here. Contrary to most, I'm sorry, contrary to postmodern propaganda, our conviction to knowing and claiming Christ as the one true way to the Father does not necessarily lead to imperialistic domination by Christo fascists who compel others to accept their dogmas, ethics, and versions of history by means of military, economic, and cultural domination. 
These, of course, are to be rejected. Our Orthodox saints, and indeed the saints of all places and all times, whom we Orthodox see as inspired by God, have always opposed, even to the point of shedding their own blood at the hands of their own earthly powers as well as their enemies. Whatever the case, Orthodox Christians today must be prepared to tolerate every error and every evil while at the same time unmasking its falsehood and rebuking its sin. And we must be ready as well with real rejoicing and without reluctance or regret to affirm whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, with anything excellent and worthy of praise, wherever and in whomever these divine realities are found. And this brings us to the imperative for us Orthodox Christians in postmodern pluralistic societies is not only to be tolerant of those who don't share our beliefs, but to evangelize them, to witness that to them, to serve them without domination, discrimination, or condition. Death, not life, is ultimately what postmodern pluralism is about. It is the essence of its ethos. In other words, death is the essence of the ethos of postmodernism, pluralism. We are speaking here not merely of the death of the mind and the spirit, but of also the soul, the death of the soul and the body, and the human community and society itself. The postmodern pluralistic societies that we live in call us once again to examine first world political, military, economic, and sexual practices, to examine the activity of media, to examine contemporary entertainment and art, to examine the handling of crises such as AIDS and abortion, euthanasia, right to die movements, What has been achieved for the modern, alienated, libertarian individual, postmodern pluralists achieve for humankind as a whole. In its most radical and advanced expressions, the culture of death not only permits humans the right to demonstrate their liberty by spiritual and physical suicide, but it guarantees them the freedom to kill others as well. So in other words, it's the logical conclusion if it continues unabated. Okay, that was a lot. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I think I'll restate is that for our young people who are faced with, um, with being possibly persecuted or marginalized because of their truth claims in Christ, uh, it is, um, I'm not sure there's much we can do to change that, you know, and I'm not, but I think what I was, what I was trying to say by these material that I drew out is that our situation today is not unique to situations of Christians throughout history who made truth claims and stood up for that and sometimes suffered persecution, marginalization, and martyrdom. And that, but that in itself, enduring these privations is, is, the, wit is the most powerful witness in itself that changes the world. I mean, it's, try to imagine this little sect of followers of Christ back in the first century. They changed the world. I mean, it went from this little tiny sect of followers of Christ, you know, perhaps at most a few thousand people, to becoming the faith of the Roman Empire in a matter of 300 years. And that was because of the witness of martyrdom. It wasn't because of 
anything else, really. That's hard for us to accept in, a, in our modern society because we've, we're so comfortable with what we have, the, way we, the life that we live. And to imagine anything less than that or without it is almost unimaginable and oftentimes avoided at all costs. Anyways, okay, I'm done talking. That's St. Paul talking about uh, you know, those who follow the law, meaning the Jewish law, and those who, but, those, but he also talks about the, 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 the ethnic, the Gentiles, the nations, those who are not Jewish, who also follow a law, and they, he basically says that the law that was written on their hearts. In other words, that natural law that is part of us being created in the image and likeness of God. So, and he's saying that those people can be saved as well. Uh, they don't, I mean, he was arguing a little bit more against the, the Judaizers who said that you had to follow the, the Mosaic law to be a Christian and to be saved. Saying, no, you don't. You've got these other people over here that have a natural law that makes them just as, just as uh, equal to you who came from the nation of Israel. Uh, so, so I think that's, so that is in line with what we talked about earlier tonight was that, you know, orthodoxy, we, do, we don't have exclusivist, exclusivist claims to salvation. We, we don't say if you're outside the church or you're not orthodox or you're not Christian, you are not saved. We don't say that. that there are some ultra-traditional fundamentalist orthodox Christians who do, but but in terms of the mainstream of orthodoxy, no. Yeah, I'll have to look it up. I don't remember the chapter verse. Yeah, I'll, I'll find it for you. Rhonda? Good point. So the question is, you know, we have in the early church, or at least at some point uh, in the early Christianity, have a, a practice that only Christians could marry other Christians in the church. And then you have uh, later when you have a, 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 a splitting of the church between East and West, and then you have a further splitting in the Reformation. Uh, and, and at certain points where Christianity is a mi minority religion in, the, in certain areas, uh, you, the church in its pastoral considerations for its people begins to, uh, for its members, begins to allow them to be married to people who are not of the faith, in a sense, not of the communion of faith. Uh, so they could be Christians of another sect or what we now think of as another denomination. And the church, the church did this so that their, mem their full members would retain their membership in the church. Because before that, if you got married to somebody who didn't share in the same cup, the Eucharistic cup, then you were also excommunicated. But the church realized that that doesn't always work. Uh, uh, as well, ideally. So the church made a, a, let's say, a pastoral concession to allow marriages between people who are of the same Eucharistic cup to others who are not. Now that didn't, that was for the benefit of the, the Orthodox, but not, didn't allow that non-Orthodox to become Orthodox or to receive the, the Eucharist. Uh, 
or the other sacraments, they would have to do that by joining the faith. So, so, so what I think your point is is that that church is showing a kind of a toleration, if you will, uh, of these other faiths in doing that. Correct? Yeah. So, other questions? John? That's what he said, yeah. The way I'm seeing how things are is that if we're truly pluralistic, you can still make true claims and not be alienated or, or persecuted in a culture because you're just, you're one opinion and one explaining. Right. But just like, um, as an example, you know, Tim Keller, he was, uh, he's a Presbyterian pastor in New York City. Kristen Theological Seminary was going to give him an award, like an Abraham Piper award. And then when certain people in Princeton found out his views on ordination and, and marriage, they withdrew the award. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking if, if we lived in a pluralistic society, those things probably wouldn't happen. But it seems like there's like a secular orthodoxy that exists now where um, Seems like we're moving beyond pluralism to something else where you have certain views. What was that last if phrase you have, used? If you have certain views, you won't be accepted in the culture. Okay. So it, it kind of seems like we're moving beyond pluralism. So I was just wondering what you might think about that. Okay, so there's a couple things. I think what he, what Hopko was saying is, is that, you know, we're not going to go back to some ideal where everybody shares the same faith. And you know we don't have any disagreements, and we're probably in a we're in it for a long time, where we're going to be uh, different faiths, religiously multicultural, if you will, or pluralistic. But what? But it? But this speaks to the issue that we I think are experiencing now in our society is that the ideal of pluralism is that everything's kind of equal or can coexist equally, even if it's different. But in reality, <laughs> that doesn't play out because all of a sudden there's, I think this is what your point is, is that there's a new uh, suedo orthodoxy, I mean with a small o, that is creating a new set of values by which people are measured against. So, you know, it's, so for, in, for example, we, I think an easy one to talk about is tolerance. You know, tolerance is like this universal value in our society now. So everybody must tolerate everyone else, but, but if you make truth claims, for example, to say something like, I don't believe that same-sex marriage is valid or appropriate, you now are labeled as intolerant, and you are marginalized in various ways, perhaps I don't know if we got to the point of being persecuted, but but all of a sudden now that's kind of flips it on its head, and now we're not really being tolerant of each other anymore, <laughs> or certain, you know, in other words, certain certain things are not tolerated instead of living by tolerance as an ideal, and uh, so I think what your point is is that's that's post pluralism, perhaps, and I, yeah, I mean that's a that's a good argument. And I think that what Hopko is saying is that if we look at pluralism as the ideal, which is, this is really why I identify it as a heresy, is because it's not the, pluralism is not the ideal. It's not, God doesn't want us to be divided among, in our beliefs and our practices. He wants us to be one. And what, and, but, if, but by raising pluralism as the, some ideal that, that's how everybody, everybody gets saved because everybody's got their own flavor of ice cream now in terms of religion that they can have and everybody's saved and it's, it's all equal. You've got a new idol, you've got a new God now that's different from the God that we believe in. And when you've got an idol, you've got problems. And so I think we're starting to see perhaps 
the manifestations of that problem. I think an Old Testament analogy would be King Solomon who Yes, good point. Solomon, who you know, was the, considered the wisest, uh, you know, wrote the wrote books of wisdom that are in our scripture. Yes, absolutely. So, so you, your two main points are that uh, freedom has been elevated to uh, a, almost a universal uh, belief, perhaps an idol, a god for people that we, because I have the freedom to choose, I can choose anything, and that, and when we perhaps say that certain choices are not appropriate or sinful, that that creates consequences for us. Your second point is that uh, in terms of the evangelistic approach to dealing with multicult multi, uh, multicultural religious pluralism or postmodern plural religious pluralism is that we are who we are is as much has as much of a an effect on people as what we say, and I would agree. I can't remember which church father said. He says, "Everywhere you go, preach the gospel, and sometimes use words." Yeah, so it's so that that's that's very much true. I, I find it interesting when I'm around certain groups of people. They'll. They might swear, or they might do something else, and then they say, oh, I can't, Father's here, I can't swear. Like, it's okay when I'm not here to swear. <laughs> but the point is, is that, again, by the, what you stand for as a Christian, Orthodox Christian, the beliefs that you hold, the, the way you carry yourself, the way you act, does have an effect on people. And uh, so that's, so yes, good, good point. Any, any other questions? So, Mark, did we, did, did we, did we uh, answer your question? I, was, I know I kind of delayed it early, the answer earlier. I hope, I hope I answered it. It's good. I, did, I think there are other questions that were raised that, that, that helped. It was more of a collective paper. It was spurred through other conversations. Okay. 
Very good. Uh, So uh, uh, we're, we need to wrap it up. One thing I would say to, to close is when those when uh, tolerance does not equal acceptance of, let's say, inappropriate or sinful behavior. I mean, we can we can tolerate people by loving them without without accepting their sin or as somehow valid. That's that's. I think, the, as again, I would say that's the unique witness that we have as Orthodox Christians, that we can, let's say, love the sinner but hate the sin, right? And, and, but if, if we're not, but unfortunately, many people's experience of Christianity is hating the sinner, right? So, so that's, that's where we are called to that higher standard, to even love our enemies, those who are persecuting us because of that. So, all right, let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, faint-heartedness, lust of power, and idle talk, but rather give to me your servant a spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love. Yes, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own faults and not to judge my brother or sister, for you are holy, always known, forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you.